There are days and there are places in history where time seems to stand still. And in the space of one moment, the fate of the future is decided. Such a moment occurred on Sunday, the 7th of October, 17, 1571. It is a spectacle that would have made uh, an impression on anyone who looked out upon what used to be known as the Gulf of Lepanto. There was this gigantic fleet very slowly approaching. It had the south wind at its back about 270 galleys and a tremendous number of what is known as light craft formed a semicircle. I didn't know this. This is interesting. Which is the crescent, which is the symbol of Islam. So that's how all of the Muslim forces in these different boats in the fleet were lined up. The uh, flagship bore a flag which had been brought from Mecca in Saudi, which is today Saudi Arabia, which had the name of Allah on it in Arabic, embroidered in gold 28,900 times. That flag was captured that day, and Paul VI, during his unhappy reign, gave it back to the Muslims. In the year 622 of the Christian era, a man who declared himself the prophet of his own God, the Saudi Arabian God, a combination of Jewish, Christian, corrupt Jewish, Christian, and then uh, pagan ideas, had issued a call for the conquest of the whole world. That is the essence of the religion that we still fight today, which is Islam. Islam means submission. In other words, you submit to my religion. By the very name, it is not so peaceful a religion as President Bush and others would have us to believe. But what stood in the way of that fleet, to all those ships, to all that naval power, winning that battle, taking the kingdom of, of, of Venice, and then from Venice, the whole of the Christian West? There was a smaller fleet which sailed into the wind. They therefore only had the power of oars, their ships were lined up in the shape, yes, the shape of a cross. It's very interesting. The flagship was called the Royal, and it flew a, a blue damask standard, which, thank God, we still have, until someone decides to give it away. And on this standard was the image of the crucified, the crucifix. In this sign shalt thou conquer. From the precious blood of God on the cross... The church developed and gave birth to the great civilization we call Christendom. But this civilization that day, in 1571, was under attack. After Mehmed II had conquered Constantinople, and with it all the Christian empire of the East, the Turks regarded uh, the day of their universal dominion as, uh, as eminent to come at any time. They had in 1521 taken Belgrade, and in 1526 Hungary, and they were already then at the gates of Vienna. And in Italy they had invaded and laid waste to all the coastal regions of the southern part of the peninsula. And in 1570, the Turkish ambassador at the court of Venice carried an ultimatum from the Sultan of the Sublime Port, as it, was, as it was called. Either you give up the island of Cyprus to us, or there is going to be a war. Venice refused with disdain this ultimatum, and Cyprus did fall to Mo uh, the Muslim fleet uh, in August of this same year. Now, according to the terms of the surrender, all of the troops of the Christians, of the, of the Venetians, were to be safe. No one would be put to death. But as soon as the Turkish took over, they captured the Christian commander, and he was skinned alive by the Turks, and then his skin was stuffed with straw, and 
his, his uniform was put on on what was left of his corpse, and it was dragged throughout the city. And there was terror in the Mediterranean Sea, because it seemed that Islam had the same fate in mind for the rest of Europe as for the Christians of Cyprus. This tells you why, by the way, you remember from the 60s, there was quite a bit of to-do in the early 70s in Cyprus. That's why the Christian Cypriots can't bear the Turks, because they are blessed with a long memory, which here in the United States we sadly don't possess. Now, what made the difference was that seated upon the papal throne was a true pope, a great theologian and a saint. His name was Michele Ghislieri, took the name of Pius V. We know him as a saint today. He appreciated the seriousness of what was facing them, and since the Turks had already declared war in conquering Cyprus, he realized it would not be on their part a, a preemptive strike, but simply a defensive measure, a defensive measure against this attack of the Muslims. And he, with very moving words, uh, urged all of the Christian powers to fight against the aggressors and for Christianity to be defended. It is interesting to note that not everybody responded to the call of Pius V. Um, the victory of the Turks had been made possible in part by the complicity of certain Christian powers such as France which was supposedly the eldest daughter of the church, but which actually at this time encouraged and financed the Turks in order to weaken France's traditional enemy, Austria. And it was also in the name, oh, about a century later, of the hatred of Austria that the French uh, had... Um, sided with the Protestants in the, the Swedes in particular in uh, Europe and thus many countries today are Protestant rather than Catholic because of the French political policy. France of course was to pay dearly for this by the terrors of their own revolution. But still, thanks to the prayers and uh, the exhortations of the Pope, there was an alliance formed. Spain, Venice, and Rome made an alliance against the Muslims, uh, joined by the Duke of Savoy and then others. When the Holy Father was saying Mass, came to the last gospel one day before the battle. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He had what's called an, um, a spiritual intuition, which is more than intuition you and I get, that Don Juan of Austria, uh, John of Austria, should head the Christian League. He, he was only 25 years old. He was the illegitimate son of Charles V and the half-brother of Philip II of Spain. Uh, and he, he, made, uh, he made a wonderful leader. The fleet was assembled, and uh, they sailed some 20 days before the battle itself occurred. It lasted, the battle did, five hours. Its outcome was decided in the center of the formation where the flagships were grappled together, forming a, a floating battlefield on which attacks were followed by counterattacks until finally the decisive attack took place. During this attack, Pasha, who was the Turk commander, was shot dead, and the crescent flag was hauled down, and the crucifix was put up. You can imagine the immense psychological blow to the Muslims when that occurred. Now, this fight was an occasion for many Christian men, to, as they say, to cover themselves with uh, glory. One commander, the commander of the left flank of the fleet, actually fought on a good long time with an arrow in his left eye, if you can imagine. And another man, who was, I think, at the age of 75, fought on, on the deck wearing his slippers because the slippers gave him better traction on the slippery deck with the blood and also the, the water washing over it than regular shoes would. Um, 
the younger brother of the of the of the Venetian commander Filippo Pasquale, at the age of twelve, uh, was with his brother when he died, and his brother told him, "You'll come with me, and you'll see this battle, and you will see how Venetians fight." This is how we serve. It's this tremendous bravery, such as you wouldn't see today. Uh, at that time, the Italians were, were renowned for their, their courage and their honor throughout all of Europe. Uh, by the 20th century, though, it was unfortunately quite the opposite. An eyewitness gives this description. The sea was full of corpses tables, clothing, Turks who fled by swimming, others who drowned, many shipwrecked vessels, colored crimson from so many killings, ships that looked on fire, others that went to the bottom, the rocky coast full of Turks who were fleeing and at whom our galleys were firing cannons at a furious rate, so many little boats of the enemy were beached, making a horrifying and frightening spectacle for the losers, but a sight that brought our men, on the contrary, joy and delight. At the end of the battle, the League had lost about 7,000 of its men, and there were about 20,000 Christian wounded, but the Turks lost more than 25,000, and 3,000 of the Muslims were taken prisoners. And so the name Lepanto entered into history. For the first time in a century, the Mediterranean was free, and this victory marks the beginning of the decline of the Ottoman Empire. You know the, you know, you know the next part of the story, how St. Pius V was going over his account books with some of the cardinals the afternoon of the 7th of, of October, and all of a sudden he stopped and he went to the window and he saw the victory even though it was taking place thousands of miles away, a couple of thousand miles away, he saw the victory, and he, and he said, My lords, let us no longer occupy ourselves with business, but let us go and thank our Lord, because the Christian fleet has, had obtained the victory. The Venetians realized, in spite of their valor, it was not they who conquered, it was the Virgin. And so Venice commissioned... Um, a panel in the, in, the, in the meeting room of the Venetian Senate which said non virtus non arma non duce sed Maria Rosari victores nos fecit it was not courage, not arms not leaders but Mary of the Rosary that made us victors now, today, of course, they would tell you that Pius V, instead of getting together a coalition and starting a war, should have reached out the hand of friendship, because after all, Islam is a very peaceful religion, and they should have sought peaceful coexistence. Um, and for, for, for people who think this way, Lepanto and the Feast of the Rosary should be just a, a distant memory, nothing more. They believe that to defend ourselves would be fanaticism. And what we need to do is to get away from the idea that there is only one true religion, or indeed that truth is possible for man to discover. What is known today as radical Islamism is perfectly coherent interpretation, quite historically legitimate, of their religion. And it will, of course, continue to grow stronger within Islam over time. And the so-called moderate wing will itself uh, be subjugated. But remember that even the so-called moderate Muslims belong to Islam, submission. You must submit to our religion. Uh, Islamic terrorism is only one part and whenever there's one part that gets all this media play a strategy you've got to be on your guard the other part the way they're going to actually win the victory is by simple demographics they have the babies Christians don't anymore because Christians have birth control 
Muslims don't have it. They have the babies. They are going to win. The Bishop of Smyrna in Turkey said a long time ago that um, uh, that the Muslim victory formula is this. With your laws, we shall conquer you. With your might, we shall dominate you. And that is what you see today. France being severely chastised for centuries of political sins against Christendom has today in the South become largely Muslim. And that will only increase in time. And, and the policies of the government are such as to encourage uh, this kind of immigration and to encourage the multiplication of these peoples. Now, if the modernists would accuse St. Pius V of fundamentalism or fanaticism, then he must also accuse our Lord and the Twelve Apostles of the same sin. Because our Lord sent out his missionaries, telling them this and this alone is the truth. The weapons which they used were the message itself its superiority, its necessity, absolute necessity for our eternal life, and even for any kind of happiness here on earth. It is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostles taught as well that earthly happiness is, is relative, because after all of original sin, and that in order to defend this threatened civilization, not in order to impose our faith upon the whole world, we must at times take up arms in order to accomplish that end. The church has always taught and believed that there is a right to legitimate self-defense. We believe we have something which is worth defending and that there are some goods in life which are more valuable than even our earthly life. That is our faith and our Christian culture. It would be wonderful if we could avoid wars simply by labeling, uh, by not labeling the aggressor as the enemy. Uh, however, the enemy always chooses us. We don't, we don't choose the enemy. And I assure you today, I am not talking about Iraq. Iraq is not the enemy. The gates of the Gulag, the concentration camps, stand open for those who will not do everything they can in their power to defend Christian civilization. That will be the end uh, destination for anyone who believes that there is only one truth and that truth does not have many sides to it. The Catholic Church then has never professed pacifism. Uh, there are some evils greater than just physical evil. And the, the Catholic Church has taught us to distinguish the causes for a just war. According to these causes, what's going on today in the press and with President Bush can be seen easily as not a just war. Uh, we had a true pope in Pius XII in a radio message in 1948. He explained that, uh, that peace... Peace comes as a call from, from God's law itself, but is, but is defined as the tranquility of order. This presupposes a just moral and social order, a Christian order. Thus you have our work cut out for us. Uh, it is a natural order in which the laws of reason and nature imprinted upon the human heart are duly respected. This justice uh, represents the common good that we may not renounce because the renunciation of this common good, the denial or destruction of the natural order of things, the Christian order of things, has as its consequence our unhappiness now and our eternal destruction in the fires of hell. The goal of peace, Pius XII explained, is the protection of humanity's goods insofar as they are the goods of a creature. Uh, a people that is threatened or already unjustly victimized, if it wants to act in a Christian manner, cannot remain in a state of passive indifference. 
that's you and that is me today. The Christian doesn't fight because he loves war. He fights because he loves peace, true and a just peace, according to Christ's standards, who alone is our king. According to just war theory, war is illicit when it is waged without cause, but for those whose cause is just, war is not only illicit, but in certain cases mandatory. Let us reflect in closing on the real enemy, the enemy within, who threatens us. Radical Islam is not wrong, as they'll tell you in the media, because it claims to possess the truth. It is wrong because it possesses error and not truth. If in trying to uphold the truth, we end up, up in opposing error, we uphold relativism instead, a vision of the world in which everything is fine and you have your truth and I have mine, and the whole idea of truth has to be thrown away, then we fall into a far greater error than that of the Muslims. The, the Christian combat presupposes the vision of a world on which truth exists, truth is worth living for, and truth is worth dying for. It is the truth of the Holy Gospel. In the place of this, the modernists offer us a vision of a world in tones of gray, where there is no longer any right or any wrong and that submission, Islam, may very well be our future. This relativism makes us want to avoid all sorts of uh, conflict, all sorts of polemics, and finally to give up testifying to what is good or, or true or just. This is the spirit of apathy. It is directly opposed to the spirit of the heroes of Lepanto in 1571, the spirit of the martyrs in every age. Martyrdom is the highest embodiment of the virtue of fortitude. The essence of fortitude, Thomas Aquinas teaches, lies in the disposition to suffer in order to bring about the good. For the sake of the good, the angelic doctor says, the brave man exposes himself to peril or even to death. We are the heirs of Lepanto, ladies and gentlemen, but sometimes we have proven ourselves to be quite unworthy of the glorious champions who went before us. The message of Christian fortitude that battle, that victory handed down to us. Christian fortitude which makes us willing to sacrifice the good things of this life for the better things of eternal life. Lepanto, may it always remain in our hearts and in our spirits. Today the West the Christian West is undergoing an attack without precedent, not only from within, but even from without. What remains of Christendom deserves to be defended because it is from this sometimes it seems pretty small remnant that a different and a better future could be constructed for generations to come if our prayer, the powerful prayer of our many rosaries said together, is heard by heaven. How must you fight? You must fight by praying, but you must also fight by informing yourself and informing your neighbor. Don't be afraid. How are you ever going to fight with an arrow sticking out of your left eye if you're afraid if someone looks at you crosswise when you disagrees with the nonsense they have to say at a family reunion, reunion or at, at work tomorrow. Inform yourself. Inform others. Don't give up. And then, by all means, if you're going to make the victory of Lepanto ours today, pray the rosary. Thank you for your attention. God bless you.